These are my kids. We were hiking in the Oakland woods when my daughter noticed that someone had thrown a plastic tub of cat litter into a creek. And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, that doesn't go there. And this really innocent smile and comment. And when she said that, it reminded me of when I was a kid growing up. I used to go to summer camp. And on the morning of visiting day, right before they'd let our anxious parents come barreling through the gates, the camp director would say, quick, everybody go pick up five pieces of litter. You get a couple hundred kids each picking up five pieces, and within a few minutes, you've got a much cleaner camp. And I thought, why not apply that crowdsourced cleanup model to the entire planet? And that was the inspiration for starting Literati. The vision is to create a litter-free world. But let me show you how it started. I took a photograph of a cigarette using Instagram. And then I took another photo, and another photo, and another photo. And I noticed two things happening. One, litter became artistic and approachable. And that was simply because of the power of Instagram. It kind of brought me closer to the environment in a way that I hadn't before. The second thing was, at the end of a few days, I looked at my phone, and I had 50 photographs. And I had picked up and either thrown out or recycled each and every piece. And I realized that I was effectively keeping a record of the positive impact I was having on the planet. That's 50 less things that you might see or you might step on or some bird is going to get tangled up in. And so I started telling people what I was doing, and they started participating. Again, using Instagram, of all things, to photograph individual pieces of litter, tag them literati, and then throw out or recycle what they're finding. And it started to spread. And one day, this photo showed up from China. And that was the point that I realized that literati was more than just a collection of pretty pictures. We were becoming a community, and the community was generating a ton of data. Each photograph tells us a story. The easy way to think about it is that it tells us who picked up what, a geotag tells us where, and a timestamp indicates when. So the next thing I did was I put together a Google map, and I started plotting the individual points where I was picking up litter. This is downtown Oakland. Those are the points where I started. And as this community grew, well, the data grew. My two kids go to school right in the bullseye. And I showed this to their teacher, and this woman looked at me, and she said, that's awful. And I said, actually, it's way worse than that, because this just represents what a few of us have picked up in the last couple of weeks. The reality is that we are surrounded. We just don't see it anymore. Litter is so commonplace that it is blending into the background of our lives, and we as a society have become desensitized. But I started asking this question, what if it weren't like that? What if it wasn't in the background? What if we could bring it to the forefront? How might we use technology and data to really start making a difference? I'm gonna show you three ways that we at Literati have started doing just that. The first is with cities. The first city that ever caught wind of what we were doing was San Jose. Some of you may remember a campaign that took place, which was I Heart San Jose. They ran it around Valentine's Day. And we worked with them to create a campaign. And the campaign was simple. It was a photo contest. They used it as a way to mobilize their community, get the citizens involved. What better way to show your love for San Jose than by keeping it clean? And we gave away prizes and tickets to Cirque du Soleil and the San Jose Sharks and vouchers for local restaurants. And San Jose was just interested in, again, mobilizing their community through this very simple action on Instagram to keep the city clean. Then San Francisco caught wind, and they had a very different idea. San Francisco wanted to understand what percentage of litter came from cigarettes. Why to create a tax? on all cigarette sales. So long before Literati existed, the city put a couple of people in the streets with pencils and clipboards, and those people walked around collecting that information, creating a percentage, which then drove a 20 cent tax on all cigarette sales, which as you might imagine, generated a massive revenue stream for the city of San Francisco. 
And then they got sued by the tobacco industry, who claimed that collecting information with pencils and clipboards wasn't precise, and it sure wasn't provable. So I get this phone call from the city. Hey, we heard about Literati. Can your technology tell us what the percentage of cigarette litter is? And what the city didn't realize was that at that time, our technology was literally my Instagram account. And I was like, yeah, we can. <laughs> Four days and 5,000 pieces later, we did. And Literati's data was used not only to defend, but double the tax, which now generates an estimated $4 million a year in annual recurring revenue for the city to help clean itself up. During that process, I learned two things. Number one, as you might imagine, Instagram is not the right tool. <laughs> so we built an iOS app. Last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago on Earth Day, we launched Android to 5,000 people just on the waiting list. That was the first lesson learned. Second lesson, if you think about it, every single city in the world has what we call a unique litter fingerprint. What you see on the streets of San Francisco looks nothing like what you see on the streets in Seoul or Stockholm or even Oakland. And if you could generate a massive new revenue stream just by taking the time to understand the data of cigarettes, what about coffee cups, potato chip bags, candy wrappers, soda cans, and the list goes on. Again, how might we use the data to make a difference? And if you could fingerprint San Francisco and Oakland, well, what about Central Park? Or the entire northeast of the US? Every country has a litter fingerprint. What we're seeing in Amsterdam looks a little bit different than what they're seeing in New Zealand or even places in sub-Saharan Africa. Second group that we've started working with are brands. Whole Foods ran an Earth Day campaign. Anybody who comes in with one Literati photograph gets a free baked good. Worked out really well for Whole Foods for two reasons. The first was it was a great PR story. The second one was they knew anybody who came in for their free baked good was going to shop. It was a great, simple campaign for customers to get involved and be benefited Whole Foods, it benefited the planet, and it certainly benefited the customer. Here's an example of something that we started doing, and it'll give you an indication of how we look at working with brands. As you might imagine, the data set that Literati is collecting is very unique in the sense that we have all of this brand data, and many people think that the brands are to blame. Our perspective at Literati is, we're all in this together. The brands certainly have a shared responsibility to creating more sustainable packaging. You and I have a shared responsibility to making sure we don't throw things on the street. Schools have a responsibility to making sure that they educate our youth. Cities have a responsibility to making sure that the waste, waste cans are properly emptied on time. This will give you an idea of how we think the right way to work with brands is. Again, downtown Oakland. This block is so badly littered, it's hard to imagine. 19th Street Bard is a few blocks away from here, if, if that adds some context. So the Literati, got, the Literati community got together and picked up 1,500 pieces, which I know sounds like a lot. I'm telling you, it's nothing. 1,500 pieces. We learned three things from the data. The first was most of the litter came from Taco Bell. Not a big insight, because there's a Taco Bell on the corner. Here comes the insight. Most of the Taco Bell litter were their own single-use plastic hot sauce. Those little plastic packages, right? But the real kicker was that most of those plastic packages of hot, of hot sauce had never been opened. Now you've got the root of the problem. It's one thing to go clean up a beach or a city block but it's another thing to understand the root cause of the problem. Why? Because once you understand the root cause of the problem, you can have a proper path to a solution based on the data. So now imagine you could take this content, imagine you could take this data and go back to Taco Bell and say, listen, we're not here to shame you, but not only are you causing an environmental impact, you're also losing money. Okay, so. The skeptic says, well, maybe one of those packages is a penny in plastic and a penny in sauce. We did one walk. 
and found a couple hundred of them. Let's scale that out to a year and then multiply that by the 5,000 Taco Bells there are. Now you're talking about real numbers. But imagine if Taco Bell said, okay, we're gonna get out in front of this story. We don't need to be the villain. We have an opportunity to become the hero. And here's what I mean. Taco Bell says, you know what? We understand that part of our packaging was ending up on the ground. So here's what we're doing. You want hot sauce? You have to ask. Or we installed bulk dispensers. Or we worked with a firm like IDEO to come up with much more sustainable packaging. Now you have a brand who takes an environmental hazard, turns it into an economic engine, and they become an industry hero. That's how we believe you work with brands. The last group, and the group that I am most proud of that we've been working with, are schools. Why am I most proud? For two reasons. One, it all started because of my kids. And two, if you are really going to create change for the long term that sticks, there is no better place to start than with our kids. Let me show you what schools have been doing. One, they've been creating art exhibits just as a way to create awareness. Two, they've started adopting literati as a citizen science platform. Schools are doing creative writing assignments. Go home, take one literati photograph, come back the next day and write an essay on how that particular piece of litter ended up on the ground. What that's leading to is the students are then having discussions about what can be put in place to prevent that from happening. An example might be a young girl takes a photograph of a Wrigley's wrapper that's on the ground. The story that she comes up with is that it flew out of an overflowing trash can, so the next day the kids get together and design trash cans that have lids. Here's an example of one school that blew me away. In Modesto, California, a group of fifth graders picked up 1,247 pieces of litter just on their campus. And what they learned from the data was that the most common type of litter on their campus were the plastic straw wrappers from their own cafeteria. So these kids went to their principal and said, why are we still buying straws? And they stopped. Simple. And they learned that individually they could each make a difference, but together is where they created the impact. The literati community started right here in Northern California with two little kids. And today, it has spread across the world to 114 countries. We were averaging 10 pieces a day. Today, we did about 4,000. And you know how we've been doing it? One piece at a time. Thank you very much. I believe that uh, I'm now given the opportunity to take a few questions and answers. And I'm happy to answer any question that you have. Yes, ma'am. Um, two areas that I find on is um, movie theaters and baseball stadiums. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you've done anything with that and maybe if you went to the San Francisco Giants and, and said, if we clean up the stadium before we leave, could they lower the ticket price for us? <laughs> Something like that. Before we talk about baseball, I'm curious about movie theaters. You mean just outside movie theaters? When, no, people bring stuff in, you know, their, their Coke things and stuff, and they just leave them there. And then the crew has to come and clean them out. Why can't you just take that with you and dump it when you're leaving the, the movie theater? But nobody does. It's almost, like a, it's, it's almost like an accepted sort of thing. And the same thing with your peanuts and all your crap in the, in the arenas and in sports things. It, it's just accepted that somebody else is going to clean up after you. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this is one of those problems that nobody thinks about. First of all, it's not fun. It's not sexy. And most people think it's not my problem. Not only that, but it affects all of us. And it impacts the economy, the environment degrades our communities, kills wildlife, and now poisons the food system. Quick little horrible fact if you want, to, want one to <laughs> go home with. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Economic Forum just came out with a report not too long ago. By 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So it impacts all of these areas, but you're actually hitting a, a very different point, which I think makes it even more complex, which is you're talking about behavioral change. And that's real hard. Really, really, really hard. You have to give people not only a reason to care, but also a reason to take an action that makes a difference. 
one of the things that we've heard from our community is that traditionally people have picked up a bottle cap in Seattle or San Francisco and those have been isolated quiet acts. What difference would it make if I picked up this one bottle cap? I'm all alone in this massive problem. What Literati is starting to do is serve as a unifying umbrella. The technology allows those individual isolated acts to become social and shareable and that means it goes from overwhelm to empowerment because now I know I'm not alone. Back to your question about baseball. The San Francisco Giants actually have a program called Clean Sweep, which I thought came because they, a couple of years ago, swept the World Series, but actually it was because they wanted to give back. And they've done an amazing job working with a lot of schools. To your point about could they then incentivize people to reduce ticket prices for contributing to a greater good, we actually think there's a huge opportunity with that. So with our application, we're not there yet, but we're approaching a point where, let's say you picked up your 50th piece of litter in the streets of San Francisco, what if in the application you could be served a $25 voucher for BART just as a token of thanks from the city? There's lots of interesting creative ways that we can start to align interest between city and the citizens that live there. You're doing a great job, thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the presentation. I thought it was very informative and also it's excellent what you're doing. My question is around kind of your partnerships with corporations and to what extent are they starting to go beyond mainly marketing and PR, for example, the Whole Foods example, and two real collaborations where you mentioned the Taco Bell example? We have not done any proactive outreach yet. It's all been inbound, and frankly, that's just been because of a lack of resources on our end. Um, right now, we're getting inundated with interest, and we need to be able to bring in the resources, capital, team, infrastructure, to allow those things to happen. With brands, I think that this is one of the slip, most slippery slopes there is for us, again, because so many people feel that the brands are responsible. And you can imagine working with a Taco Bell might look very different than working with another brand that has similar values, like a Patagonia, right? So Patagonia is not a company whose litter is on the ground, but they're very much about sustainability. Or imagine we could work in collaboration with Clorox or Glad Trash Bags or Purell, or you work with any top-notch advertising agency in the city and they could start to come up with some really creative collaborations. That is a long-winded answer to your question that we haven't really started to explore what deep, deeply integrated partnerships could look like, um, but we have some ideas internally that we think could be pretty cool. Ma'am. What can we do about the people who litter cigarettes <laughs> and people who don't take their doggy poop bags and they just drop them on the sidewalk or along the grass area? In front of my house, there's three or four people that smoke and drop their cigarette butts. And it just irritates the heck out of me because when it rains, it drains into the drain, which goes out to the ocean and kills things. It's you know, it just ruins the environment. I wish I had an easy answer for you. The reality is this is really hard. Like really, really, really hard to solve. I've picked up more litter than you could ever imagine. And it's like a Sisyphean task, it never ends. You ever see, anybody ever seen Fantasia? You know the Mickey Mouse segment with the Sorcerer's Apprentice where the brooms just keep splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting? That's what this is like literally because everything is breaking down, right? That stat that I quoted earlier, more plastic in the oceans than fish is not off. That is nuts. And it's because so much of the plastic is breaking down into microplastics. Um, it's really hard to do anything about people who just culturally throw something on the ground. It's not in all societies. You go to Tokyo, the streets are spotless. But Tokyo is an anomaly. Back to this woman's comment earlier, it's about behavioral change. I don't believe in punitive measures so hard. First of all, it is really hard, unless you're hanging outside a bar morning, noon, and night to catch people throwing cigarettes in the street. And here's another interesting thing, is that most people think that uh, all the litter on the street comes from people throwing things on the ground. That's just not the case. 
If you walk outside these doors right here, the streets are covered. You would think that you would be seeing people throwing things down all day long, realistically, other than a cigarette butt, when was the last time you saw somebody throw something on the street? Doesn't happen that often, right? So that tells you that there's a more systemic problem at work. Infrastructure needs to change. I don't know what you do about the smokers, other than continuous, you know, make it easier for them. There was a great campaign that took place in, I think, Brazil. Here's what they did. They took Brazil's most famous soccer player and Argentina's most famous soccer player. They put a transparent container on a wall, and it just said, vote with your butt. <laughs> and so people would drop in their discarded cigarette butts. That was brilliant. There's lots of ideas like that we can come up with. The dog poop, you're on your own. As a dog owner, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.